This is the 3D Viewmaster CBS television series Manix. Viewmaster Reel 1. Picture 1. The personable young Japanese who called on Joe Manix one day turned out to be Tami Okada, fellow private eye from Tokyo. He had been hired, he explained, by the father of Akio Iguchi, the diplomatic courier who had been mysteriously kidnapped while on a mission to Los Angeles. I need your help, he told Mannix. Courier must be found soon, or father will be disgraced and must atone. Harakiri. Picture 2. Mannix agreed to help and the two following Tammy's only lead, sought out lovely Midori Nakano, a dancer in Bueno Park's Japanese village. While they waited for the girl to finish her performance in the popular sea theater show, Tammy explained that she was the only person the missing Akio ever contacted when off duty during his trips to Los Angeles. Already Manik's computer-like mind was sorting through the possibilities in what was beginning to shape up as a crime with international implications. Picture 3 The interview with Midori was ple pleasant but unproductive. She either wouldn't or couldn't tell them anything about Akio they didn't know already. Nor did she know Takeshi the Japanese who apparently had played the role of chauffeur of the limousine which had met Akio at the airport and in which he had been spirited away under the very noses of security guards. Neither detective had yet met Takeshi or the self-declared real chauffeur, a man named Kato who had shown up right after the kidnapping with a tail about having been waylaid by the abductors. All too soon Mannix and Tammy were fated to make the acquaintance of both these gentlemen, along with a homegrown variety of thug. Picture 4 The moment the detectives left Midori called a number. The man who answered was the missing Akio hiding out in a shabby hotel room. He assured the girl no one would find him. Later, in response to, call, to a call from Tammy, Mannix alerted his old friend, Lieutenant Malcolm, of the police. Couple of hoods are after the little guy, he said after explaining about Tammy. Something bigs behind this. I'm going down to Little Tokyo now to back him up. Could use some help if you're in the mood. Picture 5 The search for Tammy took Mannix to the martial arts arena, where he quickly found himself involved in more martial arts than he had bargained for. Bounding from concealment, the murderous Takeshi attacked him with a samurai sword. Mannix had time only to wrench another ancient weapon from the wall in order to parry his assailant's slashing attack. Picture 6 Takeshi was most skilled in the use of the samurai, but Mannix felt the swordman's overconfidence might provide an opening. Wreckage spread as the contest of primitive weapons raged, but at last Manik's greatest strength prevailed over the other, other's quickness. Knocking Takeshi's legs from under him, he pinned him to the floor and was preparing to tie him up when out of nowhere a pistol butt came smashing against the side of his head. Blackness engulfed him. His new assailant, though he couldn't know it, was a hired gun named Pike who had come to the aid of his confederate after putting 
Take me out of action in another part of the arena. Picture 7 For a time the detective's life hung in the balance while a brief but sharp controversy developed between his adversaries. The Japanese, who belonged to a fanatical nationalist movement, twice raised the sword to finish the job. Pike's sole interest in the caper was money. He wanted no part in a murder. Once he bluffed the fanatic out of carrying out a grisly execution. The second time, however, Takeshi was halted only by the sound of swiftly approaching police sirens. Lieutenant Malcolm was responding to Manik's call. Viewmaster Reel 2 Picture 1 The lieutenant and Tammy arrived in a dead heat, but not before the hoodlums had fled. They received, they revived Manix, who shakily managed an introduction in spite of a splitting head. After agreeing to cooperate in the investigation, the two private eyes returned to Manix's office, where a visitor awaited. It was Midori Nakano, whose face betrayed fear bordering on panic. Picture 2 the frantic girl said two men had come asking about Akio and that when she tried to call him a stranger answered. I'm afraid they have killed him, she said. Manix and Tami sprang into action. They traced Akio to a Japanese nightclub. There they learned Akio had gone to an obscure Buddhist temple. Manix and Tami followed, but they arrived too late. Akio had gone there, it appeared to atone for his failure, to carry out his mission. His body lay on the temple floor, pierced by the ceremonial sword of Harakiri. Picture 3 Uncomprehending but respectful, the two westerners waited while Tami knelt in pray, prayer with the temple priest. Once outside again, so the Japanese turned a worried face to his friends. Was not Harakiri, he said, was murder. Explaining, he said, in Harakiri one must tell family other loved ones why he dies. Akio did not, so was not Harakiri. Picture 4 Following old custom, they took gifts next day to the bereaved Midori, who tried to shed new light on the puzzle, but failed. Next, they tried the Japanese consulate, where an attack attached informed them the courier had delivered his diplomatic pooch the morning after his disappearance. The attached, too, believed Akio had then gone to the temple and committed Harakiri. Picture 5 Next, they interviewed Kato the driver of the waylaid limousine. He told them only one man had committed that crime. Mannix was frowning as they left. I've got a feeling he's lying, he said. Picture 6 At the door to his hotel room, Tammy found on the floor a match he had placed on top of the door. Someone was inside. He debated a moment. The use of violence was against his principles. On the other hand, he and Mannix believed that they were up against men who would stop at nothing. The time had come to put into practice the arts of karat, karate and kung fu, at which he was a recognized master. Tiptoeing a few paces away, he let his muscles relax, took the required number of deep breaths and exploded into action. Picture 7 the man inside was Pike, who lunged for his gun, but far too slowly for the whirlwind that was Tami Okada. Within seconds he found himself on the floor, looking into the muzzle of his own gun. Keeping Pike covered, Tami backed to the phone and dialed Manik's office. Come on over, Joe, he said, and bring your recording equipment. I have a bird 
here who might be persuaded to do some singing and so please do not let it become known in Japanese community that a private detective from Japan is guilty of using violence. Cue Master Reel 3 Picture 1 Pike's story, pride from him with help from Lieutenant Malcolm, implicated Takeshi, a terrorist sent from Tokyo to assassinate James Cotter, the new US consul, consul to Osaka. Immediately after hearing Pike's taped confession, Mannix learned that the consular limousine even then was en route to the airport with Cutter. Picture 2. Mannix's mind was racing. Pike had confessed that he and Takeshi had hijacked the consular car, so Kato had lied. He would have lied only if he were part of the plot. Mannix leaped to his feet. Come on, Tammy, he snapped. We're off to the airport. At that very moment, the flag-marked limousine was pulling up alongside the plane. Kato, the driver, began stowing Cotter's luggage away under the eye of the, of the pilot. As he finished the task, Mannix was speeding through the airport entrance gates. Picture 3 with Kato at the wheel, the limousine was just leaving the aircraft's side as Mannix and Tammy drew near. When the chauffeur saw who was at the wheel of the other car, he jammed the accelerator down and off they raced, from one end to the vast airport to the other. But in the end, the detective proved the better driver and cornered the big car against a fence. Out of the car in a flash, flash, gun drawn, he confronted the fogity thief. Picture 4. Jamming the gun against the terrorist's head, Mannix grated. Your job was to kill Cotter, wasn't it? So why did you let him go? The man licked his lips. I don't know what you're talking about. Mannix's eyes narrowed. Or did you plant something on the plane with him? A telltale flicker of Cato's eyes gave the answer, and Manic shoved the gun into Tammy's hand. He's put a bomb on the plane, he rasped. Keep him on ice. I've got to stop that plane on the ground. Picture 5. Cotter's jet was starting. Its takeoff run when Manix with the throttle floored caught up with it. He blasted the horn, waved, swerved from side to side. Nothing worked. One move left. Veering in front of the racing plane, he forced it to come screeching to a halt. Picture 6. Leaping out, the, de the detective waved his arms and yelled, Get out! Get out! You've got a bomb aboard! This quickly brought the pilot and the, co the consul dumpling out. Meanwhile, the resourceful Tammy had flagged down an airport security officer who in turn called for bomb disposal experts. In record time, the lethal device wired inside. One of the suitcases had been removed and diffused. The case of the missing career was ended. Picture 7. Next day, at her request, the detectives met Midori at the Swan Lake, where she handed Tamir baggage. For Akio's parents, please give to them with my condolences. He bowed formally, promising he would, and as she left, looked wistfully after her. Meeting is beginning of parting, he said, old Japanese saying. Smiling, Manik said, Parting doesn't have to be permanent. Tammy brightened, nodding. Maybe take note, he said with a grin for his new friend.